So this video is all about the normal tangential coordinate system in dynamics, breaking down acceleration into normal and tangential components. So let's get to it. So imagine that we have an object traveling like this in a circle. And as you can see, my pen is moving at a constant speed. It's not, a, it's not speeding up like this and it's not slowing down like this. So most people would say here that the acceleration is zero because as you can see my pen is moving at that constant speed. But actually no. We do have acceleration here. Remember velocity is a vector. It has a magnitude which is how, how, fast, how, how fast are we going. That's the speed. And it has a direction. Basically, where am I pointed at that instant? So because my direction of my velocity vector is changing, I will have acceleration. So my velocity vector at this point is here, at this point is here, at this point is here, and so on and so forth. And notice that I'm keeping the lengths of these velocity vectors the same. Now that symbolizes that my speed, that magnitude, is staying the same as we observed when my pen was sort of rotating around that circle. But since the direction of my velocity is changing, I will have acceleration. This particle will be accelerating. And maybe you'll remember this from your physics class. The acceleration is that centripetal acceleration, v squared over r. So at each point, we'll have acceleration pointing towards the center of the circle here. So in dynamics, it's not called centripetal. It's called normal. Normal acceleration, v squared over r. So of course, my speed could be changing too. So mathematically put, my speed could be changing with time. And that's another way that my velocity could be changing through the change in its magnitude. And of course, both of these could be happening at the same time to create our total acceleration. So let's say we're moving in a circle again, but as you can see, the particle is getting faster and faster and faster. So my tangential acceleration, which is this one, will be in the direction of the velocity. So this is my tangential component part of my overall acceleration. And in purple, we have the normal, aka centripetal part of my overall acceleration. And again, both of these things are happening at the same time at the same place. So both of these things come together to create the true actual acceleration vector. So if we take a look down here, you know, and we assume that, you know, my particle's speeding up like I illustrated over here, that tangential component would be in the direction of the velocity. It would sort of be helping the velocity. It would be boosting the velocity to increase it. So here it would be right here. And of course I would add these two components of velocity to create this true velocity vector. And of course when we add these two perpendicular you know, acceleration components we would use the Pythagorean theorem and add up. We, we would use the Pythagorean theorem to, to figure out the length of my hypotenuse, which is the true acceleration. So the magnitude of my true acceleration will equal that whole Pythagorean theorem right triangle statement. 
between the two components of my acceleration. The tangential, which again is the changing of the magnitude of the velocity, and my normal acceleration, which comes from when the direction of my velocity changes. And just to illustrate, let's say that I'm traveling fast, but then I'm getting slower and slower and slower. So maybe at a point here, I know my velocity is in this direction. This is the way I'm traveling. My normal will always be pointed towards the center of the circle that I'm on. So that's easy. So here's my normal acceleration, v squared over r. Now in this case, my tangential acceleration is in the opposite direction of the velocity. It's not helping the velocity get bitter, bigger. It's actually opposing it. So here is my tangential component. And if I do that vector adding, add those two vectors, a n and a t, this would be my true acceleration. So when I'm slowing down, my tangential component is in the opposite direction of the velocity. But when I'm speeding up, it is in the direction of the velocity, helping the velocity get bigger. And of course, that centripetal normal component is easy. It's always pointing towards the center of the circle. No hard thinking required there. So normal and tangential, this normal and tangential way of thinking is very useful if your origin is in the center of the circle of travel. You know, if your object is traveling on a circle and your, you know, origin is right in the middle of it. But we can use this normal tangential approach even if our object isn't traveling on a circle. So we can imagine some path, some arbitrary path some particle takes as it's flying around. So we can actually have normal and tangential stuff going on here, even though we're not traveling on a perfect circle. Let's say our particle is right here in red. We can sort of fit this curve with the circle. We can sort of pretend at this instant our particle, only at this instant, our particle is at or sort of traveling on this circle. So the normal sort of axis, remember, because these are normal, or this is a normal tangential coordinate system. So our normal axis, just like the x-axis or y-axis, our normal axis would, of course, be pointing towards the center of the circle. And the tangential axis would be in the direction of the velocity. So here's our t-axis. So the normal component here would just be my velocity squared, my speed squared, divided by this radius right there, the radius of the circle I'm on at this instant. And of course, my tangential acceleration would just be how much is my speed changing. If my speed is increasing, that tangential acceleration will be with my velocity. It will be in the direction of that t-axis. But of course, if I'm slowing down, that tangential component will be in the opposite direction of my tangen tangential axis, in the opposite direction of my velocity. If my object was here at the time of interest, that sort of circle that we're on at this instant will be a lot smaller as we can see here, which means that my normal acceleration will be a lot bigger with the very small r, this number as a whole, will be a lot bigger with a smaller denominator. But of course, it'll, that n axis will still be in the center, towards the center of the circle that we're on at this instant. And in just the same way, my t-axis will be in the direction of my velocity. So here's my t-axis, and here's my n-axis.
but the same exact stuff applies even though we're traveling on a you know non-circular path on a whole so if we're on this random curved path how do we calculate the r of these circles it's not like it's a circle and we're given the radius of the circle i mean this the circle that we're traveling on is going to be different at every instance. Well, there's a formula that gives us this radius of curvature. Radius of curvature is just more the, more the word you use to recognize that the radius will change at every single instance. The radius of curvature. And there's actually a nice formula that we can use for that from calculus. Well, actually, it's not quite a nice formula, but it is a formula. So this right here is basically the Greek letter uh, rho. I think that's how you spell it. But it's just the same thing as the R we've been talking about. Just another symbol that means the exact same idea. So to calculate this radius of curvature, we've got to know what's called the path. We've got to know y as a function of x. We have to know the exact y is a function of x equation for the motion of our object. If we don't have that equation that tells us where exactly this particle is you know, going, we won't be able to calculate the radius of curvature and we probably wouldn't have enough information to solve whatever problem we are working on. So you normally want to use normal tangential approach here. If you're either traveling on a circle, a pure circle, like these guys, in which the radius, of course, will be known, or you're going to have to be given the path equation. That's how you know that using a normal tangential approach may be a good idea. And for instance, you know, let's say I was traveling on a ski slope like this, and that slope was y is equal to x squared. This would be my path. And the formula tells us that, okay, we have to take the derivative of that path, and that's no problem. dy over dx for this path will just equal 2x. And we also have to take the second derivative, and that would just be uh, the derivative of this, which would just be 2. So y double prime equal to 2. But yeah, that's how you navigate this. Okay, one last thing before I forget. Sometimes wacky things happen and they'll give you, you know, the, the speed of the particle in terms of s. You like it when speed is given as a function of time, you know. Remember, acceleration is the change in velocity with time. So in this case, it would be simply 2t. But here, velocity is given as a function of s. Or you may be given acceleration as a function of s or weird stuff like that. So in cases like this, you'll want to start thinking chain rule. What we have is a function in which s goes in and v comes out. Well, of course, as time goes on, s changes. So we can imagine that there's some equation out there in the, in the universe in which we can plug in time and get our position. So we have this chain of variables. This function right here is the one we're given, v as a function of s. And although they don't give us this one, we can imagine that there's probably some, you know, some equation out there, some equation out there governs exactly where exactly, you know, what the s is for our, for our object at whatever time. So what chain rule says is if we want to see how v changes with time, that is, if we want to know dv dt, we'll have to take how v changes with s, that's dv ds, and multiply that by how s changes with time, so ds over dt. That is the chain rule of calculus right there. So dv dt is just a, 
dv over ds isn't really any formal term, any formal concept. ds dt, well that's distance over, that's the tiny bit of distance we traveled over time. That is really the velocity. So this right here is a very important tool in dynamics. So just keep it in mind. This function right here is telling me how my speed is changing with s. So we can use it with this equation here to calculate the tangential acceleration. dv ds is easy. We can just take the derivative of this equation. It would just be negative 0 0.15 and that's that, negative 0.15 and then we would need to multiply it by the speed at this instant as well. And that's how we would figure out the tangential acceleration. All right, so I hope this video helped you in understanding normal and tangential components in dynamics. In the next couple of videos, we'll actually work through some practice problems. And feel free to ask any questions in the comments that you may have.